Should be going live. Got it. All right. So um, those of you who are joining us on YouTube, this is the Dreamliners Book Club. The Dreamliners is a group that started um, through... Um, should be going live. I, we are going live, I believe. All right. So... Yeah. Um, those of you who are joining us on oh, YouTube, God, this is the Dreamliners yeah. Book Club. The Dreamliners is a group that started um, okay, through. Um, I'm going to. This, is, this is a learning curve, people. There you go. All right. So we are recording. And um, anyway, this is the Dreamliners Book Club, and this is a test to see how how we can do with recording live. So if you're joining me on my YouTube channel, that's what you're watching. And Jeff, take it away. <laughs> Okay, perfect. So um, I think we we were introduced to almost everybody um, that joined. There might have been a couple of people that joined at the very end, but um, or at the you know right when we started. But basically, we wanted to just reiterate that you know we're going to have a little bit bigger group this year. So what we'd love to do is kind of try a new format where people that would like to um, People that would like to share their key learning or their their nugget from the week that they were really excited about or something that they might want to try to implement in their art um, that you could raise your hand and and um, we can sort of you know moderate so we don't have everybody talking over everybody um, so <laughs> we're trying to make it a little bit structured but not like you know robert's rules of order it still needs to be a little bit light and fun so um, anyway, would anybody like to share something? You know, Judith, you're on mute. So I got a great nugget that I just loved. It was on page 20. And it was about Arthur Streeton and how he brought volumes of Wordsworth and Keats on location when he plenary painted. The title of the painting that's displayed in the book is after some poetry. I don't think he said which one, but I have a lot of trouble naming my paintings. And I just had a show and I, I just couldn't come up with great names. And somebody said, oh, you got to change your names. You know, they seem kind of dull. <laughs> so this is a fantastic idea to reference poetry because a lot of our art is poetic in nature. So I just, I love that idea on page 20. Cool. Thank you. Who else would like to sh share a nugget or their key learning for the week? Anybody? Susan, yeah. Hi. Um, I, I just, I just really love it that he illustrates all these different forms of light. And um, I have so much to learn about. Uh, I'm just learning how to oil paint. Um, and uh, I have so much to learn about um, being able to capture different forms of light, um, which I'm sure will be a lifetime challenge. Um, but the other, the, the one thing that I, I, find really fascinating and I've been interested in it for about four or five months now is is nocturnal painting and lights at night and the different the different qualities of uh of of incandescent light and um moonlight and stuff and so I was really uh pleased with both the examples um they, he has a, a section on that on page 38, um, but also throughout his illustrations, um, page 14 is candlelight and firelight. So it's just like, oh, this is perfect. There's a perfect little guidebook for me to look at these different kinds of light and see examples of how he's been able to interpret them to apply to my own learning. That's all. Yeah, Shannon. Yeah, I just want to reiterate that. And I feel like this is a book that reading it this way, I'm never going to absorb all of the information. But now that I have the awareness of what kind of information is in this book, 
I've got a painting that's, you know, I've been put aside. It's um, a picture of an airport at night. And to know now that what I need to do is just go in and, and read and absorb those chapters about the artificial light. And I thought it was really interesting when he talks about the different temperatures of the artificial light and knowing that this is a toolbox that's going to be used forever. Like whenever I'm approaching a new light situation, I know that I'll find it in this book. I'm not gonna give myself the burden of thinking I'm gonna memorize anything from this first read through, but the awareness of what's in here is gold. Absolutely. It's so good. This is like my favorite part of the book because I, I totally agree. The light temperature. Um, I mean, today I was painting and there was there was direct sunlight, which was really kind of relatively cool, neutral. And there was reflected warm light. There was reflected blue skylight. And having read this a few times and just started to understand more of this before I got this book last year it all just seemed like light to me. I didn't understand it now, like the color temperatures. It's so helpful. So yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, Jeff, I wanted to um, chime in. I was saying, I think it's page 28 where, you know, he was just really clearly explaining that, you know, on a clear sunny day, you have the three, yeah. the sun itself, the blue sky and the reflected light. And I guess I was kind of just innately aware of that, but to really think about it, I think I'll, I'll, you know, be more aware of that. Um, and he talks about, like you said, the temperature of it. So that, that was very valuable. Yeah, for the people watching, I don't think we actually announced what book we were, we were discussing. Oh. I think it's uh, James Gurney, Color and Light. There you go. Look at Jeff Eikhoff's window. So now the people aren't going, what book, what book? It sounds great. <laughs> It is an amazing book. Yeah, it's it's one of those books where, um, he, you know, he's not really in the middle of the plein air community. A lot of the um, the more marketed channels of the plein air community is not really into realism in terms of a lot of those atelier driven, you know, channels. When you discover him, you're like, holy cow, this this guy is such a good teacher. Uh, and if you're not aware of it, his um, journey, uh, Gurney Journey blogspot website is unbelievable resource. He's been posting, I think, since 2007 every day. And uh, he's got things tagged and themed. So if you're interested in a particular theme and you want to learn more, go to that site and uh, search and, and find wealth of information. <clears throat> any, other, any other feedback on you know, what Susan had shared or, or what anybody had shared. Yeah, Suzanne. So I particularly like the part about like right here on page 34, he actually has a diagram here where he um, shows like if you're using candlelight or something at night and how far out each particular, um, how much the light goes out, um, how much area it would illuminate from, you know, from your source point here going out and stuff. That's like an individual point. I, I appreciated that little part. And if you look down here with the, the mammoth picture, let's see if I can get it in front of the camera a little bit. You can kind of see the people with the light, how it illuminates just the creature, but not the background. Yet you can still see the background with sort of a cooler purpley blue um, light. So it's kind of twilight. The other thing, now I lost my page. Uh, where'd it go? Oh, I just appreciated how he talks about, you know, the, the color temperature also helps uh, set the mood in the painting, kind of, you know, uh, just depending on what you're trying to convey, what message, and that, you know, how you use your light um, can, can really help draw that out too. Yeah, and by the way, with, with this new format, um, you know, we're sort of going around the room uh, to, to initiate a conversation, but after whoever presents their, you know, favorite thing for the week, um, it's, you guys can just unmute and you know, offer your thoughts or feedback if you want. 
I also really liked page. I really like page. All... Also, um, but I was a little confused. So page 34 talked about candlelight and firelight. But I was wondering, it says the brightness of any point in source illumination diminishes rapidly with distance. Wouldn't that apply to all light sources, not just candlelight and firelight? In uh, Any sort of man-made light source, um, yes. Something coming from the medical ratio of it as it diminishes, diminished changes. So, so it, um, it's just a very fast fall off with candlelight or firelight. So hence the ratio that it's, it's compressed in space. Uh, obviously things something like sunlight is gonna have a much longer distance as well as time with its fall off. So he's just, it was, I, that was really helpful. I appreciated that chart too, because it compresses, he illustrates the, the mathematical equation of how to gauge where the fall off falls off. You, you, it, it, it exponentially doubles as you get further away, but the but the ratio is different depending on the type of light and the light source. I think it applies all to um, artificial light, not the sun. Clearly, because the sun is a giant fireball in the sky, it would take you'd have to have planets involved to get the, you know. Yeah, I think the rule. Day. I think the rule still uh, applies to the sun, but the the difference in distance is like. 9 million miles versus 9 million miles in an inch still yeah. like same ratio so yeah. it just doesn't Long fall planet. off and take it to the other end of the universe. Well, I think yeah. it's it gets complicated too because you have reflected light in a natural setting you don't have it's just not all nighttime lights and and so you have to consider that as well because everything that has sunlight on it reflects light back even at night, you get reflected color and reflected light as well. Yeah. Light bouncing off of something on something else. I, I yeah, think their stuff. light's very warm. I think this inverse square law is a law of physics. So it's a, a law for all light and also radiation. So this is how, this is a law that affects all light and all frequencies. Yeah. So do you and, think uh, it's variable with incandescent versus say fluorescent? No. Oh, it's consistent. It's the same law. <clears throat> yeah, it's um, so I, I used to be really into photography and with, with flash, this is exactly you know what you have to understand yeah. and study. Um, mm. why you know your iPhone flash can illuminate somebody pretty closely, but then way behind them it was black. Um, it's just it True. just gets swallowed up by the volume. I think this can also be useful, like if you look at um, the page where he's got mixed sources of light. Um, 38, I think it's page 42. 40, 42, where there's just a bunch of different uh, things going on. And anywhere there's a light source really, really close, like the, at the top of that painting, there's a, a light source in the very back where you can see it's the, the column and the railing that's right close to it is really brightly lit, but then it falls off. And so it's, you know, it's probably intuitively, I don't think he's measuring distances, but he just, uh, he's got using a lot. If someone has YouTube on as well, you'll have to mute your sound because you're getting a delayed, uh, a delayed broadcast on that. Um, Gabriel. I was trying to watch on YouTube, but I couldn't okay. see the faces, so I came back to Zoom. Oh, you couldn't just, see the faces? What, what were you Now saying? I can. Now I can on Zoom. Are you okay. still getting it? Uh, no, we're not getting the back, that feedback. Oh. I don't know what you're going to see on, on the YouTube. No, channel. now it's fine. I because said earlier I was it's, it's all good now. It's all good. <laughs> I see everything now. Um, can I, on my, um, hi everybody, it's Linda. <laughs> Very rainy day here, but on my Zoom, I can only see the person who's speaking. I can't see the whole room. Is that normal? Because on, I don't know how to. There are settings. I clicked all of them. So it may just have gone to that as a default. Okay. Uh, that's not happening to me. That's why I went to YouTube. I came back. 
I, I'll, I'll adjust that. I for the next and now it's okay. I'll, I'll Linda, adjust that you, to show the gallery view next time. Yeah, Linda, if you go to the top of your screen, there should be a little like a uh, Rubik's cube looking square that says yeah. view. Jeff, uh, I think can... she's she's talking about yeah. what she sees on the YouTube channel. No, I'm on. Um, no, no, no. I, I came through on the link on Facebook, so I can see. I see Gabrielle or now Nancy. I see one person at a time, but in the yeah, others. So I was just trying to tell you to go Sorry. to the top and find okay. view and then click on gallery. No, Jeff. No, Jeff. I was having the same problem. It doesn't work. Linda, just leave and come back. Okay, I did okay, that and okay. it started working. Okay. I'm leaving, guys. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think the option to just record in um and not display it live but just have it later i think that's probably going to be <laughs> the best option because this is a little frazzling but uh it's it's just i have to have some place to put it then so it's got to go on my youtube somehow it's got to go on my cloud so i'm we're going to try different things and see what happens um okay so who would like to share their nugget or key okay. learning. <laughs> yeah go ahead lauren um yeah the the section on the overcast light i like that was super helpful um especially when he talks about um how the uh the surprisingly colors appear brighter and purer than they do in direct sunlight i was like oh i guess that's true i hadn't really thought about that but when you but when you look that yeah, that, that made a lot more sense. And I think I tend to gray things down too much when I'm painting overcast scenes. So that was a good point to kind of think of and remember that the greatest color isn't in the bright sunlight or the shadows, but in the, the midtones and the overcast light. I also like on that section about saying that the, without sharp shadows that the shapes are simpler and bigger which i thought was interesting i thought i have to go out there on an overcast day and check that out uh but i but i like I overcast day everybody looks oh we don't have any shadows but obviously if colors are brighter and shapes blur it should be easier to paint. <laughs> no, and I love that one also on page 31, how the lettering uh, stands out so much sharper than I think it would if there had been strong light and shadow. I mean, even the freeway sign in the back, uh, everything, the lettering is so clear and the contrast between the the friendlies roof, the friendlies riding in the sky, they look exactly the same, the same sort of grayish white, but it really stands out. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. He also said that overcast, overcast light is the hardest to imitate. And I think that's because we do either dull it down or do something too much. Yeah, also the, the shadows, like under the roof overhang, they just drop off so softly. Everything is just very diffuse. And it's, you know, to paint something like that in a direct and fresh manner, it's really difficult. I think it's more something that you know if you blend a lot you can make it look like this and i don't know it's for me as a more of a beginner like I, I find it much much easier to paint scenes like on page 28 where there's just a very very high yeah. contrast between light and shadow um you could just make it read so much easier because you can really separate the values so yeah i think it's hard to paint stuff like on 31. Please well, I'm going to try uh, to do something <laughs> like on page 30, uh, 31 with the over, it's been rainy and overcast here every single day. So, and I guess when I get back home to Italy, it's going to be rainy and overcast every day. And so we'll get lots of <laughs> overcast light. 
I really like the tips in that one. Yeah, I thought it would be really fun to try a city scene because he says that it's a lot less comp a complicated outdoor scene like a, a, a city street is really got, you know, there's a lot of detail and everything and excluding shadows would be helpful, it seems. Yeah, that's the one thing where this light makes it so much easier to sit for four or five hours and paint a big scene because the light doesn't change that much. That's and then you've got time in a city, in a com complicated scene, you'd even have time then to yeah. get everything right. Not with sun, yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I just learned about painting out in um, overcast light was that your colors aren't as bright, but they do show up more. And like when you have the fall colors of the trees, you've got the bright oranges and the bright reds. They're very bright when you're out there and you're thinking, oh my gosh, they're just brilliant colors, even though you're in overcast. But when you're painting them, you don't put the bright, bright colors because it does show against the whiter, grayer sky they show up clear, just like you look at Friendly's in the pictures here that he has, the yellow on the awning and the green, they're not that bright on that building, but in but you see them, they pop out. So that's something to, to think about when you're painting as well. I would like to share another thing. Um, since I got here, Jeff, a few minutes late, so how are we going to do this? Are there going to be, because the chapters chapters are so short, like they're usually one page, or um, are we going to sort of decide how many pages to go up to per session? Is that, or are we all have supposed to have read the entire yeah. book? and then just choose pieces that we like. I miss that. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, since this is our first week of this new format, uh, I can just reiterate. Um, so we're reading one and two this week. And so on the little event graphic, it'll always say what we're reading. So chapters okay. one and two. And then on the, on the post where we sort of kicked <clears throat> off the book club, um, I don't know, three weeks ago or something like that, we suggested a new format where essentially instead of kind of trying to go through page by page and, and having people randomly just jump in, we were gonna we were just gonna kind of go around the room and anybody that wanted to share something could just sort of indicate, yeah, I'd like the floor and then say, I really liked this. It could just be anything from the section that we're reading this week. It could be okay. your favorite thing something you wanted to try, something maybe you tried this week and show people and show and tell. So, and then, uh, so kind of a structure going around the room, but then free form feedback and comments and just joining in after each, each okay. turn, I guess. So okay. that's kind I think of the next reading goes through page 86. That's the end of chapter four. So that's like 40 some pages. Okay. Is that clear? Yep. You look Thanks. in the table of contents. Uh, you might have missed it in the table of contents. The, about three or four flips in, you'll okay. see there's none of them are one one page or whatever. But uh, oh, okay. chapter three is probably the longest of all of them. It looks like they're about forty pages. 20, yeah, 40 the, pages the good maybe. news is the um, there is some technical information in the next chapter, but a lot of the concepts are basically two page spreads, the way he illustrates a concept. And some of them are really, really short. Some of them are a full page, but usually the text is no more than a page, but then he's got a bunch of illustrations that- Big that pictures. So. Yeah, no, I totally, I just now found the table of contents. I hadn't even seen that. So thank you, Gangrel. You're welcome. <laughs> I did try the overcast um, painting this week, but I tried it in the, I've always seen, heard people say that with urban paintings, um, that it was easier to do with complex scenes. So I tried, I live on 36 acres in Putney of woods. So I tried it in the woods with the fall color and a lot of evergreens and the leaf litter on the ground. And it was so confusing with no light. 
mm. with no, it was very overcast too, I should say. I mean, it was really socked in with clouds. And I got so lost in my painting because I just felt like I didn't have any direction. And it was, you know, with branches and leaves and trees and leaf litter and logs on the ground. It was like, ah, you know, like so really it was, a, it was an interesting track. experiment though. Oh. So I, I just had a comment between the direct sunlight and then the overcast, the two pages of page uh, 28 and 31. When you look at them, Jeff, you'd mentioned that you kind of, I think, favored the sunlight because of the shadows that you could create. Did I hear that right? Well, so when I just started painting last year, I, I was very nervous about picking something that had too much light and shadow. And so I was kind of gravitating towards this sort of softer light. And I think it was because I didn't really understand values very well. Okay. And I was painting more like local color, which made sense in the, it's the one on 31. It's just all mostly local color with a little bit of soft shadowing. But then I think it was maybe <clears throat> Kwong Ho's video, the nuts and bolts video. I really started to understand more about light and shadow. And then I was like, holy cow, like it's so easy to make a form read if you have strong light and shadow. And I didn't know that because I'd never been taught it and never, and now I just, I really love when there's stronger light because I just find it easier. Maybe it's because I'm too lazy to get those gentle gradients like James Gurney does on the friendlies building, but I just find it easier to have stronger light and shadow myself, at least. You know. Yeah, I agree with that because I'm looking between the two pages and it just seems there's a little depth missing when you look at the friendlies versus the building with the, you know, pillars and everything. And it, I think it'd be more challenging to frankly paint overcast, you know, than with, like you said, the direct sunlight and shadows and all the shapes that yeah. can come out of it. Okay. And I think that's what Linda was just talking about, about the forest scene. Like that's such an aid, the shadows become such an aid for explaining depth and overlap and, mm -hmm. and position in front of each other. And like, it just becomes a big flat abstract if you don't have all that shadow. And with even the light, on, like when she mentioned the um, fir trees or on the, when you were painting the overcast, how do you have, where's that light somewhere just to make it that fir tree stand out? you know, when it's all overcast. I, I, you use your grays. You try to mix your grays and have that area that you want to be the focal point, have that use the truer colors. But the advantage of painting on an overcast day is things don't change so quickly. When you're out there on the bright, shiny day, yeah, it's exciting because we have the shadows and the lights, but it's gone just in a second. So Right. You have a lot of time to paint outdoors when on an overcast day, and that's true, but I just... I kind of, I like the friendlies. I just don't know which way I'd feel more comfortable painting, you know, that you're very different. About Do the one you're least comfortable with and get good at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm rather a new painter, so I don't know. Maybe I'll get good at it. I've learned a lot on the Eric shows when I started watching, I guess a year and a half ago or almost two years soon, you know. I think Anna, did you, lost, you would have to be really in tune with your aerial perspective, you know, and, and be very able to really fine tune that because that's the only tool that you have to kind of express that distance. That would be my impression of how you're going work. with what you know and not just what you see. You know, the things in the distance are going to be lighter, cooler, and grayer. You know, the things in the middle ground are going to have a little bit more beef to them, and the ones in the front are going to go full range. So, learning the theory is probably a good idea. Uh, you know, when Gabrielle, when you just talked about, you know, graying the areas that you don't want to have kind of pop and be your focal point, I, I suddenly thought of some of Richard Schmidt's overcast landscapes where- He paints mostly it, in overcast. That's and, and the way he'll, you know, just have certain things that are just not really pronounced. And then, you know, Nancy's walking through the garden. She's just super bright and everything else is kind of flattened or abstracted. And so Softened, yeah. I guess there's two ways to think about it. You know, Nancy, when you and I are just talking about the light, I think it's easier if you're trying to depict what's really in front of you, but maybe it's not easier if you're trying to interpret what's in front of you and just, you know, paint something that you want to paint and like Richard might. So Anyway, just some thought. He's genius. The, the friendliest one. Um, this kind of first bank of green 
is very bright, but then you look at the very, very back trees and they're quite a blue green. It's incredibly yeah. subtle because this isn't yeah. a very deep landscape, but it's that little tweak that makes a difference. Yeah. I am um, uh, one of one of the people who um, was uh, teaching about nocturnes, um, and I and I'm not sure if it was um, the guy from California. Carl uh, Bretzky. Yeah, Carl Bretzky. I think it might have been Carl Bretzky. Um, he said, but also I took a workshop on nocturne painting um, with Joe Giersack. And um, what they said is you paint the subject and if you need to go out there during the day and draw the subject so that you have the planes of the streets, the buildings, those relationships and those shapes, you do that before you deal with the light. And they, and they said it's actually easier at night because nothing moves. The light stays in the same place, which is when you think about it, a very interesting analogy to our talking about the overcast with no shadows moving, no light moving. You know, and um, I have difficulty. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I paint landscape mostly, and I try to do plain air as much as I can. And I have difficulty with that and editing stuff and being able to establish the planes and not just getting lost uh, in the in the colors. I have difficulty with that on any kind of light day, right? Um, so what I am gathering from this is that if you can really uh, trust yourself to look at what you're looking at and identify what's essential that you're actually painting, that then you'll come up with a way to create the, the structure for that and you won't be thrown by um, the uh, won't be thrown by the fact that you're 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 working in an environment that's different than what you're used to. Yeah, that's, I think that's the key. I, I I just recently started doing nocturnes and only at plein air events because there was a, an opportunity to paint. But I was always so scared of them because how am I going to see? And once you solve the problems of how you can see your, your palette and your canvas in the same kind of light, the subject is actually really pretty easy, depending on where in the time of the sun going down that you come in. If you come in in the beginning early before the sun goes down, there's a range of things, just like when the sun comes up in the morning or sets in the evening in the daylight parts you have the same change of temperatures and light and everything that what you can see and what you can't see from that time of dusk all the way to when it's really, really dark outside. There's a big change in there. So if you're going to do a nocturne, probably the best thing to do would be go there and just hang out with a glass of wine or something and just watch what happens and find that spot that you want to capture. Then go back early, draw it up and then sit and drink wine until that comes and then just get in there and do it. Yeah. It, it, there is that change in that beginning part of the evening that that is a challenge. He, I, I remember that the other thing he said is he said doing nocturnes is like doing a still life. Yes. So if you like still lifes, there you go. <laughs> You're still going to have cast shadows at night. Yeah. You're still going to have them. Yes. Gabriel, are there any nocturnes on your left, on your right? <laughs> Over there, sure? I don't think there's not very many of them. I have, I probably have one back there somewhere, but I haven't done a lot of them, but uh, they're fun. As somebody that loves nocturnes, I, I love nocturnes, but haven't really done them. So <laughs> I appreciated the tips on the bottom of page 39, um, taking photos with a digital camera on night setting and disabling the white balance setting and then photographing color wheels. Mm -hmm. 
mm. under the different street lights. I thought those tips would be really interesting as I just start painting nocturnes. Plus going out, like Gabriel said, and <laughs> watching the differences in the early to later evening. Jeff, I have a question for you. Can we disable the white balance on our iPhones? Um, or is it you mean, are, uh, are you talking about, can you, sh can you shoot more like with manual white balance? Because it's usually set to auto. Uh, when you're yeah. in, your, in your Apple camera. On the iPhone? Yeah. Yeah. Or is it the night okay. setting you're talking about? I don't know. I'm just wondering how to do that. <clears throat> um, so it's auto white balance. This is the default mode for iPhones. And if you're shooting a okay. scene that's kind of an average color distribution, like just a erratic combination of just lots of different colors, it's going to be relatively true. If you're shooting something like uh, under fall color leaves, it's gonna try to balance it away from the golden light cord, you know, something that's more neutral. So it's probably not gonna look as good as if you can shoot with manual white balance. If anybody's really into photography and they want to shoot better with their iPhones and you're not afraid of learning a little bit about photo technology, Lightroom Mobile is a free app that you can load onto your phone. And if you use the camera with it, Lightroom Mobile, um, you can actually select, uh, if you have, I think, after the generation seven or eight, you can select raw, which it won't apply the iPhone's algorithms. It just keeps the raw data. And then you can process the photo in Lightroom. And you can totally adjust the white balance manually the way you want. You can adjust contrast the way you want. It's awesome. So um, Lightroom Mobile, if if you're interested in photography and not, not too intimidated. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Sorry for the random detour, but. No, it's no. It's great. I want to tell people about this. <laughs> great tip. Thank you. It's also a really nice way to get pictures of your um of your work if you if you can't afford to hire a professional photographer and when, if you don't have really good balanced light to take your photos of your work in. Like I'm in the crappiest, dingiest incandescent light in a hotel in Dubai right now. And that's why I look all, you know, pasty green. And I forgot to take a picture of my third painting today. And so I, I, I got here and there was a little bit of light left and I was trying to take a picture of it. And I was like, ah, oh, this looks like hell, but uh, if I would have thought to open Lightroom Mobile, I could have had a decent picture of it. So anyway. Wait, well, your paintings look great. I'm very impressed. They look great. Oh, thank you. And on the iPhone, uh, you have the option to um, move, you know, move the, the bar up and down in contrast and some of the other modes. Um, mm -hmm. So if you don't go into light mode, you can use portrait and fine tune it there. Yeah, and you can do a little bit of white balance adjustments after you shoot it. You know, you can make it warmer or cooler or whatever. The only thing is it's already applied those, you know, the color, the original color assumptions to your JPEG. And so it's only so far you can stretch it. Uh, after. But anyway, sorry, nerd out on phot photography, but back to the <laughs> back to the book. Does anybody have anything? I, I wanted to mention something about um, if anybody works in pastel, I, I, I don't know if anybody here does pastel. I took a terrific nocturne workshop with a painter that is really good at it. Her name is Christine Ivers and she's out of Connecticut, but she travels all over the country giving workshops. And um, because pastels can really, it, it, it glows with a pastel because of the, because of the pastel dust catches the light in a different way than oils do. So you could check out, check her out on uh, her website. I think it's christineivers.com. I'm not sure, but that's her name, I-V-E-R-S, and see some of her nocturne. She's, I, I think uh, the Pastel Society called her the queen of the night. She's <laughs> that good. <laughs> well, this, this may be getting off su subject, Jeff, but I always struggle with, you know, taking pictures of my artwork. You know, do you take, do you go outside? I mean, I only have my iPhone, so I go outside and 
take the best photo I can with my iPhone. Is that good enough? Yeah, I mean, in general, if if you can be in a soft box type state, like on a, on a cloudy day um, mm -hmm. near a window, it's great. But if it's a blue sky, then when you take that photo, it's going to have a strong blue cast, you know? Right. So, um, yeah, I, I think- I try to get on my porch where it's kind of covered, you know, and not any direct yeah. light. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's, if, if you, um, if you search YouTube for, you know, photographing your artwork, there's a few good, um, setups that are, that are assessed. What you really want to, to eliminate glare, if you have artificial light is to have your light sources coming from the side and use a polarizing filter on your, on your camera. But that just requires a bunch of, right. a bunch of equipment that people don't have usually. So I, I like the option for shooting in Lightroom. And then you can adjust everything manually. So okay, thanks. I, I'm, I'm really lazy, and I never do that. <laughs> Just so you know. So you can get a polarizing filter for your iPhone. They're yeah, not yeah. very. Yeah, you can. They, they, you know, Amazon, whatever, different yeah. qualities, but you can get it. Well, I'm just a hobbyist. And, Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I, I'm just a hobbyist and I'm not marketing anything. So I just take a picture and put it up and. <laughs> well, you take it. great pictures, Jeff. <laughs> I mean, you take the most amazing photos. So wow. you're our photography expert. So back to the book, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. a book. It has stuff about it, kind of. <laughs> I, I also really liked in the book all the different examples he has where there's different colors of lighting in the same painting because yeah. I struggle with that a lot figuring out which one's coming from which direction and then what color are the shadows and the blah, 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 whatever but yeah. um, there's there's he has a lot of really good examples and I appreciated that. Yeah it's, it's funny right after um, I read this chapter a few days ago I saw a portrait and I don't remember who it was by but it was uh oh I think it was uh Tim who's the guy in the east coast Tim something um a figurative artist super good and he uh anyway it was it was a painting and it, it was uh, of a, a woman and a daughter sitting on a couch or something like that and there was window light coming in from one side and there was incandescent light from the other side and it was just resolved so amazing it was so beautiful and on the side of the her calf, it was cool. And on the other side, it was really golden. And in the middle, it was kind of bounce light. And it was just like, oh, this, this guy is just so good. He understands everything about So, Jeff, you're talking about this chapter, window light, right? Where the light comes in through the window and this. But there's something yeah, I... in this chapter that confused me. In the second paragraph, it says, on a sunny day, there's often a second source caused by light that shines on the ground outside and bounces upward into the window. And it casts a different shadow on your white ceiling, right? Mm -hmm. I've tried to do that throughout the week. I have a sunroom with windows on all three sides and I, there's a deck, so brown floor and green grass on the other side. And I just don't get this. There is no, the shadow cast on the ceiling is actually from my flooring in that room where there's mm. a rug. It's a different that's what shadow. They're saying. The I, light I of the he, No, because he's saying that shines on the ground outside. Yeah. And then it reflects through your window. What page, then, what page is it? going to get 32. more? 32. 32. 32. Second paragraph, window light. Yeah, I think, uh, if you look at the, the diagram on uh, 33. Yeah, his diagram makes a lot of sense. And yeah. the text makes a lot of sense. But in practical, I've been going throughout my house. I have windows on all sides. <laughs> I have tons of windows. Well, I think, uh, I think the reason it might not work in your sunroom is because if you have so many windows, you're getting diffuse light from all directions. But no, I tried my room. other rooms as well. And everywhere I'm seeing, it's usually the color of the carpet that's making a difference 
or the color of the wall that's making a difference, you know. <laughs> and yeah, I think what, <laughs> it, what he's talking about in particular is when you have strong sunlight that's a pretty high in the sky, bouncing off, say, something like a white sidewalk or a patio that's right next to the window, you might get some sort of bounce illumination. I think it's going to be a pretty rare phenomenon when you just have like a dark interior and this kind of setup. Um, but yeah. And the, <laughs> just because I mean, the it, level that he thinks. When you about. look at his guy, his picture, it makes a lot of sense. Both the pictures make a lot of sense. But uh, in reality, I didn't get it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes those things are so subtle it's hard to see unless you yes. unless you have yeah. some, some sort of a, a a piece of paper with a hole in it two holes in it and you could see the change from closer to the light source to further away somehow where it isolates everything else uh, who was it there was somebody that had a, a software that he did I don't think maybe it was Kwang Ho. I don't it was one of one of them. They um, <laughs> he had something where you could take a photograph and you could select a particular area and it would tell you where on the spectrum of color that it was, and then you could yeah, yeah. another area and then you could see the difference between the two where you ended up. So it might yeah. take something like that to really yeah, understand that is it. that is Kwang Ho. It, it, it is Kwang Ho Painter, yeah. Painter's yeah. Guide app. Yeah, I think you can go and take a picture right. and see if that'll work for you. I don't know. Yeah, mm, that's a good tip. Thanks. Yeah, You're I I think there's clearly a difference though between like the springtime and the fall, and then when there's snow on the ground, I can the light is different in the house. I have this, this here is semi northern. Now because the leaves are all fall colors. I get a warm glow that comes in through the window. Of course, that's affected by the time of day, but even now, just in general, there's a lot of um, warm tones out there. In the spring, it gets a real cool green cast in here. So I put this wall here very neutral so that whatever I got bouncing onto there, I wouldn't get bright light hitting my eyes or, or you know, kind of to neutralize the whole thing. But yeah, yes. what, what you have outside happening does affect what happens inside. Yes, I see that at sunrise and sunset. The glow is so different. We have lots of trees back there. It's like forest. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Huge difference. Is there anybody that hasn't gotten to share their exciting thing that really wants to go? If not, we could just have free for all chaos. Oh, Maggie's raising her hand. It's a weird thing, and I, I, I kind of geek out on the science and the mathematics of this kind of stuff. But I thought that this book, these two books, were really good companion for each other. So John Potochnik's book is oh, just yeah. a deep dive oh. in the theory, the actual making it happen. How do you achieve? Yeah. The, the the technical side of actually uh, mixing up the color uh, and Gurney doesn't worry too much about mixing up all the color but why you want to do it yeah. so here you have the how and the where and and how you put it together and this is why you need to see the how to see it and why you need to see it that way and why you want to paint it that way um, and then for fun there's <clears throat> this is a really interesting book Nothing to do with art technique per se, but um, art and physics. It's more of a history um, of the world history seen through the lens of how physics and art uh, inter interact over the arc of human history. And I have a bunch more, but I'll leave it there. Oh, I do have to show this one. If you do quilting, if you have, if you're fuzzy with colors and understanding how colors interplay with each other, um, put away your your painting books and pick up a quilting book. How color is manipulated and used in order in this in fibers and fiber art. Color, um, Katrina um, has is very very skilled with this to paint with swatches of fabric colored fabric. So when you're wanting to understand the relationships and how colors are adjacent colors are affecting each other this really reduced thinking of it 
from a culture's perspective, um, helps it helps wrap your head around the theory. How do you learn about quilting? <laughs> cool. I have to run, but it was super nice getting started on all of this with you guys, and hopefully I will be able to join in again soon. Okay. Thanks. If we're done discussing the book, should I turn off? Oh, I think I have to wait. It'll just end. I'm not sure how to turn off. Either. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, Make a comment about the first chapter, because we haven't talked much about the first chapter or the introduction. The in the introduction, he talks about when he was in art school, um, how they would cut out different pieces of paper, paste them down. They were color swatches and put them next to each other. And I did that, too, years ago in art school, because that's the Joseph Albers method of learning color theory. And there is a book, and I don't know the name of it, but there's a book about that. And what it does is it trains you to see the, the differences between colors when they are next to different colors. As you move colors around, they change and they don't look, say, vibrant green. Yes, is that it? Albert, squares, and is that it? The one about Joseph yes, Albers. This is, actually, this is actually a kid's book based on his bigger book. So this, I got this from my grandkids. So this is a board book, a kid's board book, but it's, it's, um, but yeah. So Maggie, it's got, this, I looked at, I looked at the bigger book last year before I came to the U.S. And I think that the kids version the only one I green. Green. <laughs> It's better. <laughs> Albert's this one is like $500 or something. For the yeah, this, is actually, this is actually a kid's book based on his bigger book. So this, I got this from my grandkids. So this is a board book, a kid's board book, but it's, it's, um, but yeah, Maggie, this, I looked at somebody I looked YouTube at, on. Can you put yourself on mute before I came to the US? And I think that the kids are the only one I want. Green. It's better. <laughs> Albert's anyway, is like 500. Of, okay. Whoever just muted. Um, oh. That must have been YouTube playing back. Anyway, um, I was actually going to ask when you brought up Joseph Albers, does, has anybody found a source for the, the actual uh, full book that's not like three or $400? No. That's why I bought the kid's book. And you're right. It's <laughs> the, the, the specific um, theory, the idea, you get the idea and, the, and what he's asking you to do in this book, how you take three colors and then just um, switch them around their placement and then another switch out one color and you switch out are they um, the outer color the inner color um, the inner square or, and then the, an in-between uh, border between the two you just rotate those three colors in those positions and that's nine so you would end up with nine uh, swatches and then switch out one of those colors and you just keep going with another set of nine swatches because you're trying to excavate and um, learn how to see, train your brain to see the relationships um, and how those relationships shift and change or influence each other. Because as Gurney says in the intro, color doesn't exist by itself. It exists in relationship to what's around it and in relationship to how our eyes and our Eyes are actually extensions of the brain. They're not an organ by itself. They're actually the nerve. The nerve endings come out here and then you've got a little bit of jelly that protects them. That's your eye, it's directly into the brain. So, every, and everybody's eyes are different. You have a different assortment of rods and cones and you will, everyone sees color differently. Um, and so you have to do the work to train your brain for what you are seeing with the different relationships and the lighting sources and the lighting situation. <clears throat> and this is fun to do with kids. They actually get into it quite a bit. 
Um, adults tend to find it boring, but I make them do it anyway. And that was the most valuable class when I majored in art <laughs> because it stuck with me all these years is that your color changes depending on what it's next to. And you, you, if you have that ingrained in you, then you see it differently depending, you know, because it's going to change. If you put, if you mix the green on your palette, it'll look great there, but then you put it up against your grass that you just put in and it doesn't look good at all. It might be really dull. So yeah. it really is useful to um, to do those sort of studies with the Elbers approach. It used to bunk it, go to um, to the paint store or Home Depot or whatever and get all those chips, you know, the strips of chips and we'd cut them up and have to do all kinds of things with those making color wheels. And that was that was fun. <laughs> When we get further into the book, there's a lot of he has a, he has a lot he has old theory about what he calls gamut mapping, which is taking a, a variety of colors and creating you know a, a, a compositional palette um, for your for your piece. Um, so he does actually talk a lot uh, about how things are are. In how colors interact with one another. Yeah, I think that's a, that's like a, a mapped summary of what Maggie was talking about with John Petoshna's book. Um, you know, that's a, a, maybe a, I don't know, a diagram of how John's, you know, paintings would look if they were mapped on a, you know, on a mm -hmm. color wheel. But yes. I totally agree, agree. John's book is amazing in terms of uh, going through a series of exercise and understanding how limited, you know, uh, just limited color schemes work. And um, every time I hear somebody like Maggie bring it up, I feel so ashamed that I've had that book for a year and I still haven't done all the exercises because I'm just too excited to go paint not, something. Uh, I can't really do it. But there's, anyway, there's a dedication. Start the, 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 the one that does all those color studies. You, you really have to focus on, and you're doing nothing but that. I, just to do one set of color charts took me three or four days. Um, one, you know, and to follow his process from beginning to end for one set of colors. Um, and then he switch, you know, he does it for every time he switches out of color. He does the entire set of color exercises again for each, each setup. And then when you, every time you add a color, you switch out cad yellow uh, for, I don't know, Naples yellow, you've got to do it all over again. Um, well worth the time. But yeah, it's, gee, I wonder why I've never found the time to do I've it. I've never or, done that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Look at Gabriel's. <laughs> I would show you, but but they're all in Saudi, on the covering the walls of my studio in, in Saudi. Uh, Judas. Judith, well, Gabriel, can you pin Judith? So everybody's, everybody's I was just watching um the the setting that you're in and, and you're uh, which one Judith, you're such a, a perfectly set up for this the the multiple light sources. You've got the warm in, um internal lights coming from mm -hmm. behind you I from where I'm exactly. seeing my my right, probably your left. That's coming from behind you, but then coming from the side behind you, back in the kitchen, is warm, is cool blue light from some source. I have a skylight directly above me. Wow. Yeah, then there's a skylight cool. directly above you. Yeah, and you can see the shape of it on the shadow in the wall. Yeah. And the sky and is very blue. I have a lot of sun today. So it's very cool. Mm -hmm. Very, um, very, very cool coming in for me from your left. And then your your top is bouncing all this light nice. up into here. So under here, you're, it's very warm, even in the shadow um, where your hair comes around. Oh, it's very, very warm. <laughs> this is under me. <laughs> and that just changed Counting everything. Out. That just yeah. your whole, when you lifted that up, your whole chin went. Oh, yeah. Went yeah, yeah. Look yeah. at that. Look at that. Yeah. It's green it under down. Light. Yeah. Yeah. Take it down. And now it's all warm yeah. and, and purpley. Oh, yeah. Great demonstration. See? 
Yeah. Well, everybody take a picture and we'll we'll do portraits of you. <laughs> yeah. And the, you're right, the it's incandescent like in the back book. there, it's really warm. It's making you stand out. You're framed mm -hmm. very nicely against the, the wall right behind you, but there's just a hint of it to, again, my right. And that's all in the cool, this yep. lovely cool blue, almost no color light, and then directly hard, hard edge. And then there's all this soft, distant, um, warm, yellowy ochre, warm, that is also framed by the door frame, that brown of the we door have frame. To do a portrait of Judith. I'll take a screenshot <laughs> and it's perfect light for a portrait, Judith. Perfect light. Well, I don't know that there's, it's funny that the, I don't have more light here because the skylights are, I've got two skylights directly at top coming down um, above me. Maybe if I move forward more. No. It's the uh, angle of your Do hair. Do a portrait with, with I'll, I'll hold this up. Do that portrait. Oh, okay. No, wait, wait, wait. I'm trying to turn on my, my camera here to get a screenshot. Green chin. If you miss it, it'll be on YouTube. There you go. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, hold on. Hold on. I'm slow. You, you want me to do that? You can get the green chin. Uh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> okay, I'm trying. You need to get a different color nope, to show nope. that it makes a Judith, difference. Nope, no big grin. No big grin. Look serious. <laughs> you okay. can do color theory charts. Okay, I got it. That's going to be great. We <laughs> use you. What is this like just, the DMV? Just... You can't smile? <laughs> <laughs> yes, really. A flashlight go underneath your chin. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Big smiles in portraits are really tough to do. Uh, just, just a note this brings up um, the thought of all these kids with their phones on and they're texting, and you get this blue light. Here, yeah. let me get this on here a second here. Actually, but one of my favorite pictures of my granddaughter was when she was sitting there and it was in a dark room and her face is illuminated by the phone. Mm -hmm. really cool i'll have to find that picture and post it maybe that should be our homework is to paint one of these things with multiple lights <laughs> yeah. did anybody do anything what did we suggest last week we were going to do something just maybe. read just read <laughs> no we talked about something some challenge no, no homework assignment no homework. <laughs> i know i forgot it's it busy time right. of the year. my dog my dog <laughs> ate my homework Okay. <laughs> well, the one that's like the painting challenge for the month has really bright sunlight on the autumn leaves. So we could also do something like that too. Maybe I'll turn it into an overcast day and see that would be a good experiment to try. I That'd just wanted to thing. share, I've been using this light and it has a diffuser and then at the back it has uh, controls to change the kelvin from daylight to warm light oh. and all so i've been experimenting a lot with this on different objects and seeing how the light <laughs> changes the shadows and all you know like they say cool light makes warm shadows and all so is that a photography uh, light is that a light no, for photography i use it for my still lives it's called it's a newer led video light yeah, yeah i have i got a set of two of those um yeah the set, complete set you got right yeah it's and it two, comes with a diffuser uh, with yeah uh -huh. I, I, I have to figure out how to log in over here, but I could uh, I could post a link to what I got, but it's uh, might be amazon.nl, so I'm not sure, but yeah. it's, mm -hmm. it's newer, it's N-E-U-W-E-R, and uh, it's LED, um, and it's got two controls. It's got controls for temperature and also for intensity. Yeah. Um, oh, neat. So um, like we had a, I was attending the David LaFell um, flower workshop, you know, last week and they were, you know, they had some still life setups. So I could paint with like one light over my palette and my, and my, um, and my painting. And then the other light more focused on, you know, the still life and make it warmer or cooler, depending on what kind of light you wanted to have for the still life. So if you're, you're going to look at those, I encourage you to look at 
two of them if you can afford it because uh, it's it's really handy. It's not so expensive if you just buy one. Even the two, the complete set with the diffusers and all, and the stands comes for like one twenty eight dollars. I bought it without the stand since I already had a stand, so it was like thirty forty dollars maybe for one light. So, so tell me, you use these to light your still life, or to light your canvas, or no, well, to light uh, my still life. But for the canvas, wait, I'll just show you. Jeff, would you be able? Would you, do you use yours for shooting your artwork? Uh, uh, no, I, I, I don't. But you can if you have two. You need two to shoot your artwork if you want to photograph. But one is enough for me for the still light. It makes like warm light, uh, changes the Kelvin, changes the, I don't know. It looks like a pretty warm. strong light. It is, but it also has a diffuser and it, you can buy another diffuser that goes over it. And it has these barn doors, which you can use if you want to spotlight on one object. So it, it's, it's pretty neat. I, That's I, really handy. So your question about, uh, let me ask you, as, are you lighting your artwork or are you lighting the still life? Um, so I don't have a very big room, it's super narrow. So when I do set up a still life, it's, it's within like three feet of my canvas. But if I have one of the lights kind of just over, you know, kind of behind me lighting the canvas and then the other lighting the still life, you can use those barn doors to totally separate so you can have warm light just a couple feet away from neutral light and um, it's pretty handy. I think for photog if you want to take photographs of your artwork you need two you need a yeah. set on yeah. one on each side of your artwork yeah. or so that, unless that is like I have uh, LED I have the daylights all over my room I have six of those so, so Gabrielle, your question, that's exactly what I do is I basically have one on each side all the time. So there's not glare. And then um, the only problem is if I have a, a, a painting, like I took, a, I did a painting of like a backlit leaves that was almost all greens last week. And if I'm zooming in to try to, to get pretty close crop on that, the auto white balance on iPhone will try to correct that green and make it gray. And so it totally screws up the color. So you have to go back far enough. Uh, so it's got some of the wood from your uh, from your easel, or it's got something else to, to, to register that it, this isn't a green scene trying to make it gray, that it's, it's a, you know, so white balance, auto white balance can be tricky if you have a really, uh, you know, a colorful painting. So I know That's the phone does do weird things to the paintings. Uh, I look at them, I go, yeah, I don't know if I like it better or worse when you shoot it with your iPhone. Uh, the new iPhones are great for taking pictures, but you can only, and uh, I mean, I put them on my website with the ones taken on my iPhone, but you can't print from them and you can't enter shows because then, because you don't get the, 300 DPI, you only get the 72 DPI. If you want to make prints of your artwork, you need a 300 DPI. So then you uh, need uh, an SLR or a professional photographer to take pictures. I find that my, my pictures, when I take them into Photoshop, even when I've taken them with my iPhone, it tells you how large the file is. And it's like this ginormous inch by inch thing when it's really just this little bitty thing. So then if I just adjust it to 300 DPI and change the size, I'm there. Yeah, yeah it's it's fun. a fixed number of pixels. So it, it's usually defaulting to 72 DPI, which is your screen size, you know, divided by the resolution, which might be like on my camera, it's 8,000 pixels. So <laughs> it would show that it's like, uh, I don't know, 100 inches long or something like that. But to Sunita's point, it needs to be 300 DPI at the printed size. So if, it's, if you want to print it 
18 yeah. inches and, wide. And Gabriel, you should not, uh, if you are putting on yeah. the website, it's best not to put yeah. at 300. You should put at 70. Yeah. So nobody can copy it. <laughs> right. No, I, I, I only do those, like I have a, I have a print on demand company that's that has some of my artwork out there and those have to be uploaded to where they're 300, 300. Yeah, the largest yeah. size yeah. yeah so but yeah so i i want to photoshop and adjust everything and most of those i shoot with my other camera i don't use my phone right there's an app on your for your iphone called image size and it will change the pixels it will put you know it'll do whatever so you wouldn't need to have photoshop if you didn't want to just this Photoshop Elements is all you really need. And it's, yeah, uh, it is. Yeah, uh, Photoshop yeah, Elements is great. Yeah, yeah. You don't need full blown Photoshop. No. So you spend half your life trying to get what <laughs> you're not trying to understand. <laughs> I spend half my life trying to keep up with technology. <laughs> Look at us here. We're trying to figure out if, if this Zoom. Hi, Linda. <laughs> Gang, I need to run too. I, I suddenly yeah. grabbed some dinner, but it was great seeing everyone. And I'm glad everybody's excited about this book. I think it's a great book. It's a great book. It's going to be good. And thanks for keeping us all in control, Jeff. <laughs> so we're, we're you. We're we're harem control. here. Jeff and his harem keeping all the <laughs> I would say, in, enjoy your time in, in Dubai. Are it's, we uh, meeting next week? Without the realism, like I, I, I think we will meet if we can figure out a way to uh, record. Uh, so uh, Gabrielle and I and the moderators in the Dreamliners, we just need to get aligned on on the best way to do that. Um, okay. And El Eladel, you have experience uh, recording in Zoom and then saving the video file to just upload to a location separately. Okay, yep. I might reach out to you to just ask how you do that and what's the easiest way to do that. I, I looked into that too, Jeff, and it's a. I'd have to see, save it either onto the cloud or somewhere. It would be on my either on my system or on my cloud, and yeah. so that's going to lock up the cloud real quick. So, for me. Okay. Well, I also have a. Um, I have a Camtasia software that I can just record my screen, and uh, you know, upload it to Dreamliners, but. We really need to run it by the admin team and just get, make sure everybody's cool with whatever direction we're going. And so, but uh, so look for a post sometime in the next couple of days. But I, I think at this point, based on what everybody said, we would lean towards having it. And uh, then those who can't join can check out the recording and uh, we'll just keep rolling. Meantime, so. I posted the link to what's going on on, on YouTube on the string mm -hmm. of this. Dreamliners book club. So you can go see what um, <laughs> if you if you have the paid Zoom account, it does have a, a storage and it will save the recording for you. Oh, so you okay. don't need to save it on your computer if you have the Zoom paid account. Okay. Well, I'll 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 be exploring, but today was experiment number one. <laughs> And I also just want to say that I just, I loved everybody's comments. Like, this is such a cool group of like-minded people. This is what I love about this group is we can just find people that like to nerd out over the same stuff. So I really Has it been it. said which chapters we're doing next week? Well, we're going to do three and four, I believe. Three and four. Page 80, Thanks. 87, yeah. was it? 86. I, I don't remember the page, but yeah. So I will... Uh, I, I have a little bit of time tomorrow, so I'll try and get the next uh, few weeks posted out. So everybody's cool. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week.